Uh, okay, let's go to Ezra chapter 6. Last time we looked at the first five verses. Let's pick up there, beginning at verse 6, and we'll read down through verse 12. Uh, well, before we do that, the uh, uh, king of uh, Persia now, Darius, has inquired about the uh, command earlier by Cyrus to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And uh, he's found out that there was indeed a decree made authorizing the Jews to rebuild that temple. And of course, their enemies, those uh, dwelling in the land of Palestine who didn't want them coming back and didn't want them rebuilding a temple and had their own gods that they worshipped, they wanted to halt and prevent them from rebuilding. But they're coming back to their homeland, uh, their 70 years of captivity <clears throat> in that Babylonian kingdom are over. As Jeremiah said, they would be there for 70 years before they were allowed to return. And uh, let's read verses. And so he sent word back to them, authorizing the continued, the continued rebuilding of the temple. <clears throat> Beginning at verse 6. Now therefore, Tapnai, governor beyond the river, Shethar, Boznai, and your companions, the uh, Epharsachites, which are beyond the river, be ye far from thence. Let the work of this house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God in his place. Moreover, I make a decree that ye shall do to the elders of these Jews, or excuse me, what ye shall do to the elders of these Jews for the building of this house of God, that of the king's goods, even of the tribute beyond the river, forthwith expenses be given unto these men, that they be not hindered. And that which they have need of, both young bullocks and rams and lambs, for the burnt offerings of the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, and oil, according to the appointment of the priests which are at Jerusalem, let it be given them day by day without fail, uh, that they may all, excuse me, that they may offer sacrifices of sweet savors unto the God of heaven, and pray for the life of the king and of his sons. Also I have made a decree that whosoever shall alter this word, let timber be pulled down from his house, and being set up, let him be hanged thereon, and let his house be made a dunghill for this. And the God that hath caused his name to dwell there, destroy all kings and people, that shall put to their hand to alter and to destroy this house of God, which is at Jerusalem. I, Darius, have made a decree let it be done with speed. There's not a single thing in that that's ambiguous or uncertain. And uh, to his, in his decree to the Arabians, the Syrians, the Philistines, the Egyptians, who sent to inquire about the temple, they were hoping to stop the building project. Um, and they're told, verse 7, let the work of this house of God alone. Let the temple be rebuilt uh, exactly where it's supposed to be rebuilt. Notice there, verse 7 again, let the work of this house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God in his place. You can see the prophetic implications <clears throat> building a new temple on top of the Dome of the Rock, the Muslim holy site presently, and how popular that would be if they set about to begin that now. Uh, the Jews have uh, been given a great boost, a shot in the arm, by the United States moving our embassy to Jerusalem, and um, <clears throat> for which the rest of the world uh, offers nothing but indignation, because they're all anti-Semites. It's the main thing uh, about so many people. Uh, they are jealous. They are nothing but jealous of the Jew. They've been jealous since, since Abraham chose uh, his son Isaac and kicked out Ishmael and his mother Hagar. And um, they traced their lineage back to him, and therefore they've been jealous uh, of, uh, of the Jews' success. And, uh, and, and, to, and I've said before, the Jews greened up their own country. They imported millions of trees and bushes and uh, plants and greened up their own nation um, so that... There's this sort of a 
reciprocal uh, weather effect. It attracts more rainfall on Israel than it does in the Arab states just next door to them. And if the Arabs were to do what the Jews did and try to green up their own nations, which they could do, but if they were to do it, they would be, in effect, admitting that the Jew was smarter than they had been. And they can't afford to admit that. That's why they leave their nations uh, just nothing but dusty and sandy and desert and uh, very unsightly. Verse 8. <clears throat> Moreover, I make a decree that, uh, excuse me, what ye shall do to the elders of these Jews for the building of this house of God, that the king's goods even of the tribute beyond the river, that is, east of the uh, Euphrates, beyond the river, um, or west of, rather, west of the Euphrates, that the king's goods, even of the tribute beyond the river, forthwith expenses be given unto these men, that they be not hindered. <coughs> Excuse me. You see, once again, we mentioned it before, tax money, or tribute, used to finance the rebuilding of the temple. And it's exactly what's been done in Muslim and Catholic countries, and uh, the Anglican countries, the former British Empire nations, to a lesser degree, the Church of England. Uh, Non-Muslims and non-Catholics are expected to be taxed, or forced to be taxed, uh, in order to build churches and mosques. And both of those religions, Catholicism and Islam, have tried to force their, their multitudes back under an Old Testament theocracy. That's a, a religious rule of the government. And ignore the work of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. The New Testament has replaced the Jewish theocracy over the tribes of Israel with a spiritual nation. 1 Peter 2, verse 9, mentions a, calls us a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, and bringing forth spiritual fruit. Uh, run quickly over to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, and let's read verses 8 through 10, 8, 9, and 10. Ephesians 5, beginning at verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving or demonstrating what is acceptable unto the Lord. So that is the priority of God right now for the believer in Jesus Christ, anyone Jew or Gentile who is part of the body of Christ. Paul says in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 25, I forget which verse. It says, Give none offense neither to the Jew nor to the Gentiles nor to the church of God. The church right now, the bride of Jesus Christ, the body of Jesus Christ, is made up of both saved Jews and Gentiles who have trusted him to be their savior and the forgiver of their sins. Right now, God is not dealing specifically with one race of people because of their ancestry over other races. The body of Christ is what God is, uh, is, is how God is reaching the world for his own safe, uh, sake by Jesus Christ. Um, but the Roman Catholic Church has dismissed the idea of any Jewish theocracy, and of course the Muslims would do the same, uh, or any, any theocracy under Christ himself, which, which will come again during the millennium. And uh, they believe that can never be set up because all of the physical, literal, and the material promises uh, were now to be allegorized or, or applied spiritually and figuratively to the Roman Catholic hierarchy. And so they produced um, an earthly kingdom with an earthly king sitting upon a literal throne and who is given a, a crown or a, a papal tiara, a special uh, headpiece, signifying his authority. Do you know that the Vatican, or Vatican State, is the last remaining true monarchy in Europe? 
where the Pope is still uh, the absolute sovereign. Albeit he's elected among the cardinals, it's not something inherited by descent, like the, like the royal family in England. The royal family is there, but they have no control over the nation. It's now run by the British Parliament and so forth, the House of Commons and so forth. But um, the Catholic papacy is the last true monarch in Europe. A monarchy, I should say, in Europe. Go, if you will, to Matthew chapter 20 for a minute. You know, the, the Catholic Church and the Vatican State is its own nation. Um, according to Guinness Book World Records, it's the smallest independent state in the world within the city limits of Rome, Italy, on about 100 acres. And they have their own money, they coin their own money, they have their own bank, they have their own library, they have their own power and electrical system, they have their own water system, they have their own jail, they have their own police, the Swiss guards uh, throughout, um, etc. And they are, they have an ambassador represented at the United Nations, like so many other countries do, uh, the papal nuncio and, or, the, or the Vatican ambassador. They receive ambassadors uh, from countries like every other nation does. They, have a, they are a true nation, uh, government, seeking to rule over the lives of people throughout the world. And uh, I told you this before, I have asked priests if um, someone who's baptized as a Roman Catholic is an automatic citizen of Vatican State. And I've asked about three or four priests this. I got three or four different answers. One priest was very forthcoming, said yes. It means that they're automatic citizen of Vatican State. Even if they never visit the Vatican in their life, even if they never go there, they are an automatic citizen of Vatican State because that state is the physical capital of their religion worldwide and they keep track of marriage records and baptism records and a number of things. I'm glad he was honest uh, and, and straightforward with me. But notice what the Lord Jesus says here. Matthew 20, beginning there at verse 25. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. There's this uh, ascending and descending chain of command. Yeah, the Gentile world at that time, Caesar and the Roman Senate, and then they had uh, territorial governors spread all throughout the Roman Empire at the time, and everybody was answerable to someone higher up than them, and uh, they had authority over the lives of the people and of those and their underlings. But notice what he says in verse 26, but it shall not be so among you. That's got to be one of the most anti-Vatican verses in all the Bible. It shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto you, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. I have a friend that I work with, and uh, he's a pastor of another denomination. And I was asking him about the uh, denomination that he is affiliated with. And he gave me a, a hardback book published by their church, which explains their doctrines, their statement of faith, the things that they uh, subscribe to, their understanding of the Trinity, Bible prophecy, the death of Christ, the blood of Christ, and so forth. And uh, I think something such as the, uh, the, the, the blood of Jesus Christ, its, its uh, efficacy, its importance, there was maybe a page and a half devoted to describing it. But then there were, if I counted correct, there were 24 pages in this book breaking down the various costume, the robe, the stole, the part that goes over the robe that each ordained minister wears and what it symbolizes and what the um, bishop over the local pastor wears and why the colors matter and what the... Um, uh, bishop over the entire church 
uh, the colors he wears and what they symbolize and represent. So they had 24 pages devoted to their garb and uh, maybe a page and a half devoted to the importance of the blood of Christ and the gospel of salvation. <coughs> it shows where their priorities are. And, uh, but the Lord Jesus said, it shall not be so among you. When someone depends upon the, the outer garment, the robe or the special costume that they're wearing, I refer to it as a costume because they're dressing up, pretending to be something that they're not. Uh, when, they, when they're so absorbed and preoccupied with the costume, the outer attire, all that indicates is they don't know God at all. They have never been introduced to the Lord. And they have substituted some outward display for some inward uh, relationship with Christ, which they don't have. And uh, but I think Matthew 20, verse 26, got to be one of the most profound anti-Catholic, anti-Vatican hierarchical uh, church verses in the Bible. But um, Muhammad did the same thing, except that his nation, which was formed uh, after his teachings, turned out to be uh, desert nomads, worshiping an old uh, Arabian moon god or goddess called uh, Allah, and uh, promoting fornication and uh, slavery and assassination. And what's the other thing they, I was going to say, mentioned? Um, bigamy. Um, it's, a, it's permitted for a Muslim men to have at least four wives at the same time. I don't want four wives. I think I made that clear at church last week. I have one wife, and that's sufficient. And um, I love her with all my heart, and I, but I can't make her happy all the time. I, I think I could make four women happy. Solomon was a very confused young man, too, by the way. <laughs> he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. You have to know that some of those wives had to have been sisters with each other. They got married into the king's household, it elevated their status in their little town, their little village, and, uh, but they had to be fighting for that man's affections all the time. And um, he talked about it's better to dwell in the wilderness than in a white house with a brawling woman. Um, he must have spent a lot of time outdoors learning, <laughs> learning that lesson. Anyway, um, but they, they've sought to take people back under some theocratic system where, where the religious rulers have control over every element of your life, not only your religious practices, but your physical life as well. And um, I, I would say to a very a much lesser degree, the ultra ultra-Orthodox Jews, I think, would like to practice that as well. But most Jews, we call them either Orthodox, Conservative, or, or, um, or what's the other category? Uh, Orthodox, Conservative, not Liberal, uh, but anyway, Reform. Um, they're, they're pretty casual uh, about letting other people do what they want. They may um, observe the Sabbath, they might wear the yarmulke, keep their head covered all the time, and a number of things. But generally speaking, they're pretty gracious with everybody else in society, and, and they can't insist that other Jews live as they live. But there's always that small uh, group that are so extreme and extremely orthodox and rigid that they uh, can't permit themselves any grace <coughs> or liberty uh, or deviation from their beliefs. And this is what a theocracy does. It wants to control the thoughts, the actions, the behavior of the people underneath it. Um, take people back unto, uh, to abstaining from pork. Muslims have done that. They abstain from pork. Um, designate special holy days. They have that. They have the month of Ramadan where they fast all day, uh, and then they can eat at night, but then they fast all the next day for a month. And special days they go to celebrate in Mecca if they're able. Um, likewise, Catholicism, they have special days set aside to worship or honor and venerate certain saints uh, face toward a certain city when you pray. Muslims do that. They face towards the east, uh, so, uh, ostensibly towards Mecca when they pray. Uh, teach some intermediate 
station, some inter intermediate status after death, uh, such as Abraham's bosom in the New Testament, the Catholics have a purgatory in somewhere in between earth and heaven uh, to teach special dietary rules. Both Muslims and Catholics do that, not just abstaining from, from pork, but uh, the Catholics used to require abstain from meat uh, on Fridays. You could eat fish on Fridays. I don't know many Catholics, if any, who still observe that or think it's worth anything. Uh, insist on the significance of just there, of there being just one God. We agree with that, but in their interpretation, there's one God, and if you disagree with that or think that there's more than one God, then you're some sort of a, a, a apostate. But James 2.19 says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So, overemphasizing just monotheism. I'm a monotheist. I only believe in one. Big deal. So do Muslims. So do Jews. So do Catholics. We, uh, and so do Bible-believing uh, Christians. We believe in one God. We believe one God uh, has revealed himself in three persons. The Trinity of the Godhead, the triune nature of the Godhead. Uh, but we still insist there's one God, but simply professing that carries no weight whatsoever in eternity. You can profess a lot of things and still be unsaved. Um, and justifying armed warfare. Well, you had the Crusades that went across Europe to take back the Holy Land for the under the for the name of the Pope and subject and and fight against uh, Muslims who were occupying it in the Middle Ages. And then you have uh, the Muslim Jihad warriors today. Both of them believe in supporting, believe Catholics then, and Muslims now believe in supporting uh, armed warfare in order to get their way. And uh, a certain holy city, somehow it's better than others, like Jerusalem. Well, both groups do that. You have Mecca, and Medina, and also Muslims uh, revere Jerusalem as the third holiest city because of that dome, of that, that mosque there. And Catholics, of course, uh, Rome and the city of Lourdes, that's in France, and Fatima, that's in Portugal. By the way, Fatima in Portugal, or Fatima, she was, if I, if I have my connections correct, uh, correct, she was, I think, a sister of Muhammad. And the city was named after her by the Muslims many centuries ago. Uh, but now she's, that city is known as a Catholic holy site because these three children in 1917, I think, who claimed they saw the Virgin Mary appear in the sky to them. And uh, so, so that, that site and that name and that female identification with it as is a place which, in one sense, uh, Catholics and Muslims can join together and worship their respective deity or saint. Catholics will say they're worshiping Mary. Muslims will say we're, we're honoring uh, Fatima and so forth. But uh, so King Darius of the Persian Empire, he completely equips the Jews for the rebuilding. Notice again verse 4. Yeah, it says, uh, with three rows of great stones and a row of new timber, that the expenses be given out of the king's house. So stones and timber. And then verse 9, he also lists rams and lambs and bullocks and wheat, uh, salt and wine. Also in chapter 7, verse 22, look over there. It'll tell us later. Unto an hundred talents of silver, and to an hundred measures of wheat, and to an hundred baths of wine, and to an hundred baths of oil, and salt without prescribing how much. <clears throat> All of those things that the priest would use in their reinstituting of the animal sacrifices uh, uh, restore an altar. And um, the Jews who have been dispersed find themselves uh, have been dispersed through Babylon's territories and the Persian territories uh, end up receiving a blessing and a request from the king. Notice verse 10. 
that they may also, excuse me, that they may offer sacrifices of sweet savors unto the God of heaven, and pray for the life of the king and of his sons. The Bible doesn't elaborate on that, but there's a, a Gentile king who sees that God is with this people. And uh, this people have endured after having been forcibly, <coughs> excuse me, kidnapped out of their own country <coughs> and uh, made servants by the Babylonians. <coughs> I'm sorry. The Babylonians and the Persians. <coughs> We're almost done. Perfect timing. And then lastly, notice verse 11. And what should happen to anyone who tries to alter the king's order or halt the rebuilding of the temple. There in verse 11. Also I have made a decree that whosoever shall alter this word, let timber be pulled down from his house, and being set up, let him be hanged thereon, and let his house be made a dunghill for this. That's serious consequences, trying to interfere with the Jews rebuilding. Your two-story house uh, is going to be torn down and you're going to be forced to live in an outhouse. If you're, if you're allowed to live at all. And uh, you can see the prophetic implications of that. Those are clear. One day, the Muslim's Dome of the Rock is going to have to be torn down to make room for the Jews' temple. Go back to that thought as we pick up next time. And you can imagine how much joy and celebration that the Muslims are going to engage in when that time comes. Um, but if we understand our Bible and Bible prophecy correctly, the man of sin will find some way of doing just that. He may have some, through subterfuge and deception and just outright lying publicly, he may secretly have a plan in mind uh, with the Muslims at the beginning of the tribulation, and the Jews are completely unaware. They think the promised Messiah is finally returned. He says, I'm going to do some things publicly that will look as though I am the Jews' leader. Just give it some time. I need you to take down that mosque. I need that mosque to come down and let them. Let's, let's lull them into a false sense of security. Every Jew throughout the world will be wanting to make his, his own pilgrimage back to Jerusalem to worship there. You've got to know that. And once they're all here, they will set about to destroy them. I mean, you know how they talk about the elaborate planning and the scheming and the conniving and the orchestrating of all of these events um, such as, well, such as 9-11, right? President George W. Bush masterminded it. They practically have him in there planting the explosive himself. And at the same time, they were calling him an idiot who didn't know how to walk and chew gum at the same time. You can't have it both ways. But, um, but they, they, they crafted this very elaborate conspiracy that lulled or fooled Thousands and millions of people in the believing a certain thing happened when secretly this is what happened behind the scenes. Or, or the, uh, a lot of the Apollo missions, which I, I have certain questions I'd like someone to answer about some of it. But I want, I want to believe that, that the United States sent men and they set foot on the moon. I want to believe I always grew up believing it. So I want to believe it. But uh, you know the conspiracies of how much was doctored, how much had to be organized here and there uh, to create this elaborate uh, ruse, ruse that, that deceived hundreds of millions around the world. What we're watching on television was simply being done in a sound stage somewhere. But um, so you know how these conspiracy things, conspiracy things go. Everybody was sucked in. Everybody believed 
uh, what was obviously uh, turned out to be a lie later on. And you don't know, but the, the man of sin may arrange for the Muslims to tear down that mosque as part of some elaborate orchestrated scheme. And then three and a half years or halfway into the tribulation, uh, he turns on the Jews once they're all in Jerusalem and going back there to worship uh, as, their, as now their biggest enemy. They lull, he lulls them into a false sense of safety. The, the security walls separating the Jews' territory from the Muslims' territory, all those walls are torn down. And they think uh, happy days are here again and peace is uh, now the order of the day, and they'll be completely deceived and misled. I'm, I'm offering just conjecture as far as him arranging something, but that mosque will more than likely have to be torn down if that's the, the site where the Jews' temple is supposed to go, then it will have to be torn down somehow in order to make room for that temple. 